glad that you're here this morning. Uh, I hope that you've got uh, a copy of the scripture somewhere uh, in that you can get a hold of, whether it's in your group or you're sitting at home, and whether it's electronic or it's paper uh, or whatever the case may be, I hope you'll have a copy of the scriptures, and we're especially going to be in the book of Ephesians today. Uh, if you've been uh, coming to Emmanuel, uh, uh, you'll know uh, that we're in a doctrinal series. We're dealing with uh, the doctrines of the church, as we've called it, uh, of laying out the map that should guide and direct how we think about ourselves, how we understand our relationship to our neighbors, what we think about God and what his mission is for his people. Now, this sermon this morning is going to fit into that, but not in a direct way. Uh, we are deviating from our schedule of the normal topic that we would have. We, uh, if you'll remember, some of you, it seems like a long time ago now, we were talking about the character of Scripture uh, as being inspired by God, as being breathed out by Him. And that's why it's so central to the life of a follower of Christ, because we've been brought into a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ by the work of the Spirit. And His Word is what He's given us to tell us who we are, tell us who He is, tell us what life is about. And so, especially in times of crisis, we need to return to the Scriptures to hear His voice, to guide us as His people for our own sake, for our own protection, for our flourishing, and for our mission in the world. Well, today, because of the events in uh, our world, and especially in our own uh, country in America, I'm, I'm going to pull aside, and for two Sundays, this Sunday and next Sunday, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, and we want to talk about what God intends for his people, what he's up to in creating, as Paul's going to say in this passage, a new humanity. That he's taking Jews and Gentiles, which in the first century was a way to describe everyone in a very Jewish-centric sort of way, right? So the Jews would say there's Jews and there's Gentiles, but the Gentiles would say over on the other side, wait a minute, there's a tons of types of Gentiles, different classes of Gentiles, right, uh, different flavors of them, different nationalities, different languages, different cultures, so forth and so on. But as far as the Jews were concerned, there's Jews and Gentiles, us and them. Well, Paul wants to talk about what God's up to in bridging the gap between people groups and between individuals and what the people of God should be uh, and how they should view one another. So, let me enter into that. And so, we want to set the stage here first and talk about the moment in which we're in. And then we want to look at, at Ephesians chapter 2, and if you have your Bibles, we're going to be down at verse 11, but I'm not going to read that just yet. We're going to get there in a moment. So America, and if you have your notes, I forgot to mention, uh, Barb sent out some notes uh, for you to have. You want to have those uh, to write down and some uh, thoughts as they come through. I don't think that God has everything that I'm going to say for each person, but he has something that he wants to say to each person, and you need to be ready to write that down. And also, if you're in a group and you're getting ready to have a discussion afterwards, you want to have some thoughts written down. They're going to help you to engage in the discussion that you're going to have in and around this topic. So if you see those notes, you'll see it begins right here with this first phrase. America is in turmoil, and it has come right into and through the door of the church. Even if we're not in a city overwhelmed by protests and plagued with violence, we feel the sadness, anger, frustration, and desire for justice in our hearts. The terrible, unjust death of George Floyd, coupled with the negligent killing of Breonna Taylor, and what was most likely the clearest example of a racially motivated crime, the shooting of Ahmad Arbery by an ex-policeman and his son as he ran through their neighborhood, have come together to contribute to widespread and continuing social unrest. And if you're like me, Friends and family, near and far, are feeling the same, and some are urging me to action. And I feel compelled to act. This is all compounded by a babble of voices telling us how we should understand these events, who we should ally with, and how we should be responding to what's going on. There is near unanimous agreement that any negligence or abuse by police of any group based on race or of any group or individual period should not be tolerated. There is near universal agreement that what happened in these cases mentioned, that I just mentioned here, is beyond tragic. Nevertheless, the interpretation of these events, their underlying causes and real character, lead to very different responses. Right? Some people want to rage in the streets, people want to protest, 
People want to uh, uh, biblically rip their clothes and throw ashes in the air and cry out and lament, right, in terms of this. But the different responses are tied to things like, should these events really be brought together because they represent broad and characteristic racism? Or should they be seen as terrible but rare incidents that may have various explanations? And on top of that, these responses get attached to other unrelated agendas. Other people who want to co-opt and, and, and grab onto these uh, tragedies and the feelings that have arisen for them to insert other uh, uh, agendas in there, other political agendas. And so what you have is you have competing solutions are being proposed about what to do. So what should we do? How should we respond? And above all, this turmoil has come right through the doors into the church and pitted believers against each other. Right? Any of you that are like me, I don't have a major social media presence uh, in terms of that. I think I have one social media account. Uh, but I read widely and pay attention to what's going on. Uh, and if you're out on any kind of social media, if you're in the, the, the faceless book, right? if you're in Instagram, if you're in um, 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 Twitter in particular, which which happens to be a particularly caustic cesspool often, if you're on any of those kinds of things and you're following what people are saying, it is a contentious moment. And it's not unbelievers after unbelievers and this group after this group. It's believers after believers, right, in terms of that. Some of the most caustic statements that you can find there. But in a situation as murky and confusing as this one, groups of believers attack each other over what words and actions are consistent with their identity in Christ. I have seen so many passages of Scripture misappropriated in this moment, it's hard to keep up with them. What's identity? Grabbing something. Some cry, you must say this or do that, with the underlying implication that faithfulness to Christ demands these words and these actions. Exactly. Even leaders, right, boldly pronounce what must be done or said and then fight among themselves over the proper Christ-like response. Right, if you've seen that. Each group listens for key words and phrases and looks for particular nonverbal responses in their brother and sister to determine whether they're in or out. Cancel mobs stand ready to pounce at the slightest miscue, right? You say the wrong thing with the wrong tone and you're out. Whether that be something in the present or they've drudged it up from your distant past and then they want to punish you and banish the offender. They check out the allies of each other. Who does he follow? Who does she listen to? And then attribute to each other everything that those voices say or don't say, whether voices on the left or the right. There's no patience for careful statements. None are granted a hearing which assumes the best of the other and tries to understand it in the most charitable way possible. Their past relationship together doesn't matter. I don't care if you have a history of caring for people of all races generously, right now the only thing that determines whether you're not a racist is if you say X. It doesn't matter. What happens from here will determine if they can go forward together. Any qualification on your statement of whatever has to be said, that's just waffling. That's just equivocation. Any hesitation shows that you don't get it or you don't care. Silence is outright violence. People are put into camps by skin color and division threatens, or maybe better, widens. So this current attempt, I want you to, as the people of God, to think about this current attempt by the evil one to oppose God's work by turning his people against each other is part of his normal operating procedure. As the church came into existence, the Apostle Paul had to deal with class and race-based division and hostility that was prominent feature of the Roman culture. These divisions came through the doors of the church as people came to Christ and as they struggled to live, grow, and serve together as the people of God. Powerful versus the powerless. Right? Sometimes read 1 Timothy chapter 2 and realize uh, that Paul is confronting women who are coming in dressed in very elaborate ways and these are indications of their class and status and their wealth. They came in announcing their class, announcing their status, and demonstrating a division that was godless in the body of Christ. Paul's not against adornment. He's against adornment that's rooted in godless values that try to put value based on your wealth 
or put value on wealth, period. Right? So powerful versus the powerless, the rich versus the poor. And of course, in our passage and throughout, Jew versus Gentile. Right? Now, that's to even kind of simplified because we're going to look about it's not that the tension in the church was just Jews with Gentiles it was also Jews with Jews and Gentiles with Gentiles so we'll talk about that a little bit more so uh, these with Jews and Gentiles the ancient hostilities were hard to overcome Jew Gentile tensions flared up think about this if you're if you've read your New Testament it flares up in the church in Rome in Jerusalem in Ephesus and in the churches throughout southern Galatia, every major uh, mission center of the early church struggled with Jew-Gentile tensions. They were compounded by historical and current tensions within Judaism. Historical tensions within Judaism where they, in the history of the Jews, some Jews have more compromised with the secular culture than other Jews. And so when Jews came to Christ, you can read about this in Acts chapter 6, <clears throat> They came to Christ, and they all believed in Jesus, but the Jews that had felt that they had made, remained faithful to the tradition of their fathers did not have the time of the day for Christian Jews, brothers and sisters, who had compromised with the Greek culture. And so as the money came in to take care of the widows, the more orthodox Jewish Christians said, we're not giving any of our money to the widows of those Hellenized Jews. So Paul appoints some godly men to say, no, 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 that's not the body of Christ. That's not how we operate, right? As you read through uh, the, the text we're going to find, not only were there Jews between, tensions historically based uh, between Jews, but there was tensions that was rooted in different ideas among Jews who had come to Christ about what it meant to live out their new life in Christ. How much of their Jewish heritage should they carry forward in their obedience to Christ? What days should we observe? What things should we eat? And some Jews were over against others, right? And they were even trying to pull their Jewish Christian brothers back into a relationship with secular Judaism to resolve the tensions that's happening here. So it's not just Jews versus Gentiles, it's Jews versus Jews within the body of Christ, right? Which we find here, an analogy in our present moment, we've got Christians versus Christians about what does it mean to live out our relationship with Christ in this very difficult moment, Right? And then tensions existed between the various classes and groups represented by the Gentiles, right? Remember when Paul says that in Christ there's neither uh, 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 barbarian, Scythian, free, uh, a Roman citizen, slave, but we're all one in Christ. Right? So all these different divisions, they just didn't walk in the door and everybody immediately dropped all of their, their ancient tensions and their class status distinctions. They walked right in the church with them. So there were intra, meaning between Jews and between Gentiles, and inter, right, between Jews and Gentiles, racial tensions constantly threatened the life, unity, and mission of the church. Paul's prescription, and this is what we're going to look at today, was to teach them what God had done in making them his people and what resources they had to live that out. He was confident... Okay, this is important here at the moment. We want to have a confidence. My confidence is not in the Republican Party to make the right call or any given leader or the Democratic Party to make the right call. My confidence is in the power of God in Christ by the Spirit to change the hearts of people within the church to be the people of God. That's my confidence and the fact that his purposes will not fail. And even though the gates of hell in terms of division are pounding against the the, the the kingdom gates, he will not let it prevail. Right? It doesn't mean that it won't be bloody and difficult in the interim, but he was confident that God's work in Christ by the Spirit could enable them not only to stay together, right, not just to stay together, but to increasingly know the kind of unity God had made possible for their work in Christ. This is not the goal of Paul, wasn't just to say, you know, you guys just got to hang together, even though you hate each other, right? So just get in your little pockets within your church. No, you need to be moving toward one another. He emphasized the importance of this for their personal growth, right? This is something that realizes the body of Christ. For our growth, we need each other. We can't be divided into factions. For our protection, Paul's going to go on in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and say it's when the church comes together and all the body is functioning like this organism so that everybody is giving their gifts and abilities. That's when the body grows up and it's protected from outward 
effects. It won't be blown easily to and fro by the winds of uh, sinful temptation. For its growth, protection, and witness to the world, right? This is rooted in the very teaching of Jesus. How will people know, right? John 17, that we are his people by the way we love each other, right? So as Paul is writing, he's just talking about the resources we have in Christ to be this kind of people that when you look at us, you can't explain how that group and that group who have hated each other forever, right? And how that group and this group, right, the up and the down, how they would even want to be with each other or care about each other, right? How there's no envy between them or contempt, contempt coming down and envy going up. There's none of that's happening here, but you find this one people and people are looking out the outside saying, I don't know how this happened. That is, I don't get that because that doesn't happen outside of Christ. So he didn't get discouraged by the struggle and we're in a struggle. He knew that the struggle with sin of all sorts would continue until the king returned to complete what he had begun on the cross and from the empty tomb. And he didn't give in to it and let the division happen, right? So each one of these books, uh, you almost realize that Paul one time just get up and say, right, uh, envision a parent with two toddlers after a while. It's like, okay, fine. You guys, you go in that room, you go in that room. And Paul's over here going, you Jews, you go have your church. Gentiles, you go have your church. I, I, can't, I can't take you guys anymore. Right? And then maybe, maybe like, you know, once a month, get together and have a potluck. Right? Now that's going to be complicated too because of the Jewish laws and things like that about what you eat and don't eat, but at least show up in the same space together. Right? Well, Paul doesn't do that ever. He doesn't do that ever. He doesn't despair of the possibility of real community, and he doesn't give in to it. So he fought to further a Christ centered unity among God's racially and socioeconomically diverse people. He fought for it, right? He fought for it. So now more than ever, in the moment of a turmoil and crisis, we need to return to God's word through Paul to remind ourselves and each other that God's plan is not only to redeem you and me, to buy us back from slavery to sin, to make us alive when we were dead, to give us an inheritance because of our union with Christ and give us a new set of desires, new set of potentials, a new future, take the most scary things out of our future and our present, right? It's not just to redeem me individually, but to bring us together into his new people, a new humanity, a third type of thing that's not Jew or Gentile. It doesn't completely um, uh, uh, eliminate everything that marks you as an individual from your group or from your background, that's going to be redeemed and brought into the body of Christ, but it's not the primary marker of who you are. It's not the primary demand upon your life. So we need to be reminded of who God is, who we are in his people, and we need to say this to him. God is big enough to help us as the people of God to walk through this moment and love each other and bear witness to the world of who we are and what God has called us to be. This crisis isn't too murky, it isn't too big, it isn't too dangerous, right? We need to to trust God that, because God is a big God. This is the God, if you read in chapter 1 of Ephesians, who's working out everything in accordance with his will. So, who God is, who we are as his people, and because of whose we are, and what that means, we need to be reminded of the resources that we have to live this new life, and what this new life in this new family means for how we think of each other and how we act toward each other. So let's read our passage here, and uh, we're going to look at 11 through 22, but today we're only going to look at 11 through 13. We're going to come back next week and and look at uh, 14 through the end of the chapter. So let's read uh, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. All right Now, so here, let's take a look here at what Paul is trying to lay out. And uh, we want to we tie it to the broader context of what Paul is doing here uh, in the book of Ephesians. 
and he's writing right to a divided congregation of Jews and Gentiles. At least that's one issue that they're fading, facing, and he attributes that division to the work of the evil one as an outworking of what he wants to do to stand opposed to God's purposes in Christ. So when you open the book of Ephesians, it begins with a praise psalm. It begins actually with a recounting of all the great things God has done to redeem individuals and bring them together into his one new people. He's brought Jews and Gentiles together, and ultimately, through what Christ has done, he's going to write every person with regards to who they really are. They write them toward themselves, write them toward each other, write them toward God, so that he can bring everything to the fruition for the goal for which he has made his creation, so that we will live actually to give praise to the glory of God because we will fully embody everything that God created us to be. So that's his purpose, to bring up everything under the headship of Christ, right? That's a grand vision. And then he prays at the end of chapter one that they can get inside the truths that he's just told them about, that they're his inheritance, that, that he's, they've got a secure hope in the future, and that they have all the power of Christ who has conquered every one of the hostile spiritual powers, they have all the power of Christ, the resurrection power of Christ, to live into this new humanity that God has made possible in Christ. Right? Then when we turn to chapter 2, just preceding our passage, in 2, 1 to 7, he begins, he returns to that big plan and starts to break it out in its individual components. And so in 2, 1 to 7, that plan of God of restoring everything in Christ begins with the individual. So in 2, 1 to 10, it's what he does in the individual. He takes dead people... Right, who were dead, and he brings them to life. So his answer is what it is that he's going to do in Christ. So if you have your notes here uh, under uh, the, the second uh, Roman numeral here, God's answer for the unity of the new people in Christ, and he's, he's going to look at the past, recalling the pre-Christian past of the Gentiles. Right? They were alienated from Israel, and alienation overcome in Christ. So he's going to look at that uh, as he comes here, and he's going to look at, uh, uh, he's going to draw from 2, 1 to 7, where he's going to go back and say, if you're looking at your passages, the first one, the therefore that begins verse 11. So Paul continues to develop the plan in this passage, right, which was the subject of his opening praise in 1, 3 to 13. He just finished talking about, and here's a couple blanks for you to fill in. He just finished talking about what? what that means on the vertical plane, on our relationship with God. That's 2, 1 to 10, right? And 2, 1 to 10, what he did is he took dead people who were in league with the evil one in opposition to God's purposes, and the evil one was facilitating our own evil desires, and we built systems, worlds, a world that was stood over against God's purposes in a counterfeit kingdom, a kingdom of darkness, and God stepped in in his mercy, right, not because we deserved it, opened our eyes to our darkness, gave us faith, we believed in him, and transformed us into his new creation and equipped us for a whole new existence, right, to do good works, to be recreated by him. So he looks back to 2, 1 to 10, because we have been these kinds of people. Now notice here, just the sequence in Jesus' teaching. It's very similar to what Jesus says, right? What's the two greatest commands? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So Paul deals with the vertical plane because Paul understands, as Jesus made clear, as the whole biblical storyline made clear, the reason why we hate one another, to use a phrase that Paul says from Titus chapter 3, when we were outside of Christ, we were hated and we hated one another. Well, why did we do that? Because we were disordered in our relationship with God, because we'd rejected him and rebelled against him. And our hearts were darkened. And so instead of submitting to God and his rule, we became people who tried to exercise rule and be our own little gods. And what you have among human beings then is a whole bunch of competing gods trying to fight for authority and control of everybody else. Instead of mutually submitting to God, now I have a world that I want to create and I want to force you to live in it because I don't want you to have the authority to create the world because I want to live in the one that you create. I want to be in control. Right? So Paul deals with the only reason that Christians can actually love one another on the horizontal plane is because we've been righted with God and that has transformed us and enabled us 
to be able to and to even want to love each other, right? Because one of the outward, if you read the biblical storyline, what happened immediately after Adam and Eve rebelled against God? They turned on each other. Immediately. It's that woman you gave me. Right? We get to chapter 4, and we're only, we're only uh, one chapter past the fall, and what happens? Cain and Abel. Right? A brother rises up in cold, premeditated murder and takes the life of his brother. Right? So the distortion of our relationship with God distorts all of reality. And so Paul says, what's happened now for God to write things? Well, in Christ, he's made possible by belief on him to transform you and your relationship with God. So as you get God right, you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he will transform you and orient you rightly toward everything else. So that's the first step. So the second step then is dependent upon and an outgrowth of the first one. And then when you come to verse 11, he says this in a kind of very interesting way. He says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth are called uncircumcision by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. And here he's speaking to the Gentiles, but what he's recalling here is that he's just implicitly referring to the hostility that existed when they were outside of Christ between themselves and the Jews, right? He's also indicting the Jews here in that their hostility toward the Gentiles was indicative of the fact that they themselves had not put their faith in God, that they themselves had outward marks, the circumcision, right, that was supposed to be a symbol of their inner commitment to the God that that mark was meant to mean I have submitted to, believed in, and loved with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That was what it was meant to mean. Instead, it became an outward ritual that served to mark them off and they used it as a a mark to be arrogant toward and to dismiss and be hostile toward the Gentiles. Well, outside of Christ, they were hating and hating one another. They were hated and hating one another. And formally, these Gentiles that he's speaking to now who believed in Christ, right? they knew the hostility that was a part of their fallen life. They knew what it was to be hated and to hate because that had happened. And so Paul talks about one of the things that they've been redeemed from as being those kinds of people who pit themselves over against other people. The Jews, instead of being a light to the Gentiles, the majority of them, there was always a faithful remnant who believed in God, but the majority of them who rejected God and His commands, instead of being a light to the Gentiles, they wanted to be like the Gentiles. They wanted to uh, uh, be someone that was absorbed into the darkness instead of light in it. And so the hostility was there because the Jews themselves did not know the life that circumcision was supposed to be an outward symbol of its reality. And so he points to that the, uh, cir- the, the indifference and hostility toward Gentiles showed that they had not benefited from the transformation God had made available to them in his covenants. And it illustrates what God in Christ by the Spirit has done to overcome, right? wants to overcome. So he looks back to the potential. The only reason that we can hope to have unity among the people of God is because God has transformed us. That's the only reason we can have hope for that. And we have more than hope for that because the power of Christ is more than sufficient and the sovereign God to make that happen, right? We have known empathy. We have known what it's like to be outside of Christ, to be people who try to elevate ourselves over one another, to seek for vainglory is the only other kind of glory. Vainglory is empty glory that we try to accrue to ourselves or to our people instead of giving glory to God. And then we become competitors against each other for the glory, right, in terms of that. So he refers to that that you know this, you remember this hostility, and now he wants to go back spiritually, even though the Jews, right, in their sinfulness were hateful toward the Gentiles, the majority of the Jews, it pointed to a real spiritual reality that was true of the Gentiles, uh, even as it was true of the hostile Jews, is that the Gentiles used to be people who were aliens, foreigners to the people of God. They did not belong to God's people, and they did not know his security and his resources. That's who they used to be outside. And now he's going to tell them, here's what I want you to recall. And again, this is not Paul calling them to recall it in terms of what they actually remember about their life. 
this is a theologically informed picture of really who you are when you thought you were something else. Right? This is one of those moments where so often, right, if you've talked to many people, they think that God's demands can be met by their works, that I can be a good person. Now, I've heard this from so many people that when I stand before God, I'm sure he's going to look at the record and say, he's a good guy, she's a good woman. Right? They're going to make it in. I've even heard other people say, if anybody's going to make it in, she's going to make it in. If anybody's going to make it in, he's going to make it in. Right? Well, that fails to recognize how sinful we all are. It fails to reckon with the fact that God had to intervene in history to redeem and save us from ourselves because we were way better off than we thought we were. And so when we are revealed by God who, who we really were, we thought we were pretty good people. We thought we were doing okay. Many of these Jews that he's speaking to, they thought they were really good people. They thought they were observing every jot and tittle of the law, but their hearts were far from God. And so Paul is going to talk to the Gentiles. You may thought you had a great life or things were going well or you were doing okay. It was right for you to hate the Jews or whatever the case may be. And Paul steps in and said, no, this is who you really were. And this is the impoverished state you used to be in apart from that. But that's not who you are anymore. You've been made something different. So what did it mean? And you'll see the list here. And he runs through them here beginning in verse 13. Remember, at that time you were separate from Christ. Now that's the key thing here at the beginning, separate from the Messiah, right? We'll say this here, Christ is the rendering of the Greek term Christos, which really means just the anointed one. And it has to do with the promised Davidic king who was going to come to realize all of God's promises, to actually provide for people to come under his rule and to be one who would exercise God's benevolent rule over his kingdom. So a new king, right? the anointed one. So, but they had no access to the saving work of the Messiah. They had no access to coming underneath his loving, good rule. So they were absent of that. But now, because they've been united with Christ by faith, right up in the earlier one, right? And says, verse, look at verse 9, or verse 6 back here. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Well, Christ, as he's accomplished his work, sits on the throne of God and he's sat down next to him because he's accomplished his work. Well, we sit right there in the throne room with him. We have access to the Messiah King, his benevolent rule and all of his blessings, right? So their redemption, forgiveness, hope, and status is God's valued inheritance, and the transforming power of God on display in Christ's resurrection are theirs because they're in Christ. Right? Some of you uh, may remember there was a, a, an insurance company called Traveler's Insurance. Right? Their symbol was an umbrella. I don't know if you remember it. They had the umbrella thing. And they would advertise their services and says, we'll take the scary out of life. Right? And we're, we're necessary for protecting the things you care about. Well, what he wants to say here is those who have believed in Christ are the ones who have come under the umbrella of God's true eternal protection and sustaining care because they have come under the umbrella of God's redeeming love and found that in Israel's Messiah, they have been grafted into this living vine of Christ, right? They were, to use an imagery from Paul in Romans 11, they were wild olive shoots, but they've been grafted in among the natural branches and they have all the benefits of Christ. So they've entered into God's promises to the Jews, and all those things are theirs now. They're a new group of people, right? That's their primary identity. Then the second one, he says, they're separated. They, in the past, they were separate, uh, excluded from citizenship in Israel. They were separated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were outside God's elected people, right? Obviously, if you don't come under the rule of the king, and you have to be transformed to come under the rule of this king, right? Then you're not part of his people, and you're outside of all the benefits that he had. And so you don't belong to him, nor do you belong to his people. But he said back in chapter 1, now that you have believed in Christ, you've been adopted. You're in a new family now. right? And he's guaranteed that everything he promises you in your adoption is going to happen because he gave you the Holy Spirit as the down payment on everything that he's promised to you. So now you've been adopted, and one day you'll know the fullness of your identity in Christ when you're transformed into his image. Right? You used to be strangers, right? But now you're no longer. You're connected to the Messiah. 
You're a part of his people. And then the third one, foreigners to the covenants embodying the promises. It says here, uh, and foreigners to the covenants of promise. Okay? So the covenants, he's referring to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 and 15, that God would bless all the nations through him. Right? The Mosaic covenant in 24, Exodus 24, and the new covenant primarily in Jeremiah 31. Right? So they had been outside of the covenant promises of all the riches that they were going to know, but now they've been brought inside. So the new covenant promises in particular, which we celebrate every time we take communion, this is the covenant in my blood. Remember that? The new covenant promises have now become theirs by faith in Christ. They've been forgiven and been brought into a new relationship with God and His people. They've been given a new heart, a heart to love and submit to God's rule. They've been given the Holy Spirit who empowers them to become who they are, right? And who marks them as belonging to God and guarantees that they'll receive everything that God promises. Okay? So they're part of the covenants. And then the last two then speak more of of their, their ultimate destiny. Not only do they not have these resources, not only do they have this, not have this relationship, not only do they not have a relationship with Yahweh or God through Jesus Christ, not only do they not have a participation within the body of Christ, not only do they know the covenant promises, but they have no hope. They're without hope. Everything about their future is filled with the most scary things ever. That's who they used to be. And if you don't know Christ and you're listening to you today, Travelers can't take the scary things out of life. Your best efforts can't take the scariest things out of life. The only person who can defeat the darkness that plagues every one of our souls and deal with our death, our guilt, and our sin, and our failures, and who can take the future of death and its fear out of us, away from us, is Christ. And so they had no hope. They had no hope. Being outside of Christ and so outside of God's people and the blessings promised to him, to his people, is a long way of saying that they had no relationship with the real true God, right? So he goes on and gets to the bottom of everything right at the end, and he says, without hope and without God, right? So they had no relationship with God. They're estranged from him, no hope, estranged from his present resources, his future protection and blessing. But then notice, verse 11, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Every Jew, every Gentile of all stripes and all uh, classes who believe in Jesus are now brought near within one people of God, and they're a new humanity we're going to find them. So let's talk about some so what's then, and only a couple things here, and we're going to develop this more next week as well. God's plan is not only to deliver individuals on this vertical plane, but to create a new humanity, to write them in relationship to each other on the horizontal plane. This is why for Uh, as you read through your New Testament, no such thing as a person, if you read 1 John, who says, I love God and I hate my neighbor. That doesn't go together. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength naturally and inevitably leads you out toward others and particularly out toward your brothers and sisters in Christ. The life of God manifests itself in people moving toward each other. Now, second them, what does this mean to identify with them as your family and treat them as family? Now, every one of us knows that in our biological families, we've got some people that are harder to treat as family than others, right? We've got some family members, right? The crazy old uncle, crazy aunt, crazy dad, mom, brother, sister, right? All those kind of things like that. What does it mean to accept them as family, uh, even though they've got broken places and crazy things going on? Well, here within the body of Christ... God is the one who's making his family. I'm not making his family. I don't have the power to make his family. He transforms people. And who are the people that God puts in his family? Anyone that he draws to himself. Well, who is that? Rich and poor, black and white, men and women, right? People of all races, all places, all times, down through the ages. That's his family. And and God doesn't talk to us and say, okay, Greg, I'm getting ready to bring Grant into my family right here. And you get, a, you, get a, you get a choice about whether you want him to have him as a family member or not. No, I don't get a choice, right? Just like 
my, one of my daughters recently had her first uh, grandchild, but my oldest daughter has three, and when she brought her youngest one home, she didn't turn to her two older boys and say, hey, should we keep this one? You guys get a choice on that. No, she didn't give that, because probably she'd been turned down, Say, no, no, leave him there, right? No, she said, no, here's your new brother. Now we got to make this family work. And when we call them on FaceTime, we get to see them trying to make that family work, and it's funny, right? Number one, because I'm not there to have to make it work, right? And there's some crazy things going on. And there's brothers loving on each, each other really, really hard, like with a block to the head, right? Uh, or, or a smash on the ground, or a kind of a hug that's going to take the life out of somebody, right? Or throwing a car across the room because it looked really cool, only to connect with the head of their brother, right? All that kind of stuff like that. But it's not a choice about, all right, you guys, we're done with the family. We're tearing. No, no, no. No, we got to make it work. you got to love each other. And one of the things I pray for as a grandfather with my grandsons, I pray that they'll come to love each other as brothers. I pray that, that they'll be close to each other. So there's a few things here. If you're a part of a family then, and you think about the Christian family, what it means that, and we're going to talk about these more later, their joys are yours, as is their grief. That's what happens in a family. You belong to each other. You're responsible for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And you don't get to choose which ones you're responsible for. Like, I, I'm responsible for all the people who like really good coffee. That's my group. Yeah, I'm responsible for them. I'll be right there with them in every coffee shop, right? Or I'm responsible for the people that like to read interesting books. No, you're not. I, oh, I'm responsible for people who are Bengals fans. No, that's not it, right? Whatever the case may be, you don't get to choose your group. It is family. And the questions we might ask ourselves, are we entering into the lives of our brothers and sisters? Do we move toward them like we care about them? Are you actively promoting by your own life and word their relationship with Christ? Are you open to their involvement in yours? Are you inviting people in? Prayer requests, advice, friendship. Right? So their joys are yours as is their grief. And then second, we must accept our family as a given. This is what I've been talking about. We don't determine membership or decide which part of the family we want to associate with. God determines its membership. Our family is to em our job is to embrace the family God has given us. Right? And here, in this moment, do you find yourself selecting a family within the family? Now I'll tell you right now, because the racial tensions that are happening in the United States, you walk in and before, maybe you used to have a conversation as a black brother and sister with a white brother and sister, and now because all of the voices and all the weight of all the cultural thing that's coming in, you just come in and you want to avoid each other. And you don't want to have real honest conversations. So you just kind of self-select. You don't have to be obvious, you just kind of move to your corners. Right? Do you find yourself selecting a family? Are you busy setting up your own criteria? Right? Job, education, right? color, tastes, to delineate which of the family really matters to you and which one you want to be with. So we rejoice with those who rejoice, we grieve with who, those who grieve, we accept the family as a given, and thirdly, and lastly, you have been made a part, I have been made a part. So when we, we get later on in this book, we're not trying to create a unity that doesn't exist, we're trying to preserve one that already exists. And so when we resist moving toward one another and we divide from one another, uh, we're not just falling down on the job in terms of trying to move forward in God's purposes. We're literally standing against the work of the Spirit that has already created a dynamic, a reality between us. There's more real and lasting bonds between the people of God of all ages, stages, genders, races, than there is between any of those people and their nearest blood relative or, or, or identity group that they want to be associated with. We are genuinely brothers and sisters in Christ. We have been united together so much so that we're like an organism that is united together. And so the Spirit has done that, and every impulse of the Spirit is to keep us moving toward each other and dealing with all the junk that keeps it from happening. So, are we making other people's joys our joys, their griefs our grief? Are we accepting the family as giving? Do we recognize that we've been made a part? Now, I want to ask Kristen and, and uh, uh, Sarah to come and, and sing for us again here as we conclude. And then I want to come back with a few uh, uh, tips for uh, your group meetings as they come. But God 
God has done something great and grand. He is doing something great and grand. He has done it for everyone who's believed in Christ. The question is, do we believe that he's big enough to accomplish it? Are we leaning in and trusting him? Are we letting other voices set the mission and our identity? Or are we going to follow him? Thanks, Sarah and Kristen. Uh, I just want to uh, end to remind you of a couple things. Uh, I hope you have a copy of the discussion guide if you're in the small groups. And even if you're not in a group, I'd encourage you to, to pull that down uh, off the website and in your own private time or moment in conversation with other believers. Uh, it's a prompt for discussion. And uh, as true to uh, the way I described it earlier, this is not uh, uh, relationships and struggles between groups of people. There is no five-point plan to fix it all. There's no easy two, three steps. Right? It's complicated and it's tied up with all kinds of other sinful things in our own hearts and minds. And so I, I've offered you some questions here, and I want to give you some cautions about what we're not trying to do with that list. This is not a, a, a time for you to get together and conquer that list. This is not uh, that you get, well, we've got to answer all these questions and work through here. You're going to find that those questions, if you set on any one of them, are going to take you a little while to get to the point where you describe what the issues are and then say, well, okay, so what do we do about it, even as a group or as an individual? And the goal here isn't just to chat, but to be praying before the Lord and say, Lord, how can you help us at EBC, as Paul would pray uh, in Philippians chapter 1, how can you make our love abound for each other? But how, what in me is there? What is in us that's keeping us from loving each other generously and Christ-like? So I want to encourage you to do that. Take that list out. If you get one question, you sit on it, and you kind of sink your teeth into it, it'll be a good day for you. Spend some time in prayer together over it for God's help and blessing uh, as you meet together. And I'm praying for you that these will be good discussions that you can have with each other. Well, as we conclude today, let me pray for us uh, and uh, wrap up our morning service. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you for gathering in your homes. Thank you for, for taking time uh, to set before the Word of God and listen. And God has acted in Christ to not only write us with Him, but to enable us to love each other. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your mercies to us. Lord, thank You for the songs today reminding us of Your greatness and Your goodness. Thank You, Lord, that, that You are a God who is merciful. As Paul wrote, Lord, that we were dead. We were in league with the evil one. Lord, we, we responded easily to his direction and because our hearts were bent away from you. And Lord, we participated in, and were involved in systems and in choices and in relationships that amounted to devaluing one another and hating one another and exercising our power over each other. And Lord, but you and your mercy, you broke in and you changed us. You made us something new. You made us your new creation, a new humanity. And Lord, we used to be people. Lord, as the, as the Jews here out, were outside of Christ and the Gentiles who hated each other, who had this ancient animosity between them. But no, Lord, you now, as they believe in Christ, have made them a part of the same people. In Christ, in him, you've united them to each other, brought them under his benevolent rule with the power of the Spirit to live out their life. Lord, you've made them one people. No longer are they these two warring parties, but now they're your new humanity, your people. Lord, they have a hope, and they have you. And Lord, you are the God who is working, chapter 1, you're working everything out, everything, Lord. And your purposes are sure because your power is, is unstoppable. Your wisdom, Lord, cannot be defeated. Lord, your faithfulness, Lord, will guarantee, Lord, all of your promises to come to fruition for us individually and for us as a people. And so, Lord, we pray for us today. Lord, help us as your people. Be your people. Lord, help us to listen to you. Lord, save us from letting outside groups, outside parties, outside influences pit us against each other. Lord, help us to listen to each other well. Help us to be ready to repent. Help us to be ready... Lord, to confront, but Lord, help us all to listen with open ears, Lord, that we might uh, bless and, and teach each other, but also that we might correct and redirect each other. Lord, save us. Draw us to you. Lord, help us to be a light right where we are. Lord, we're, 
not after saving a nation. We're not after saving the world. We're after being your people right where we are and then let you determine the extent of our impact. But Lord, first here, we want you to rule and reign in us. May it not be the case that we're divided by classes, by educational status, by what we have or don't have, Lord, by the color of our skin or our heritage or our nationality. Lord, please help us, Lord, to be your people because you have made it possible in Christ. Lord, we do not want to resist what you want us to know for our blessing, individually and corporately for our protection and for the effectiveness of our witness. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.